I'm turning today to the second letter of Peter, chapter 3 and verse 1. Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 1. And our subject is the signs of Antichrist. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. And we'll consider at least the early verses of this chapter and seek to explain the burden of the Apostle Peter as he writes, signs of Antichrist. And first of all, I'd like to think of the protection of the mind of the believer. This second epistle I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds. Well, chapter one, notably, contained the seven virtues that clothe or adorn faith and the integrity of the inspired word. Chapter two was about false teachers in the churches. Chapter three turns to profane teachers in society at large. That's the subject now. Don't think that it's a continuation of chapter two, speaking of false teachers in the church, but still some of these may be in the church. No, now the uh, apostle switches to the great campaign against God that is waged in the world. Profane teachers and their worldview in society in general. Now verse one, and it's precious to look at some of the elements of this. The Apostle Peter addresses believers. This second epistle, beloved, the children of God, he might equally say, dearest, my dearest brethren, I now write unto you in both which I stir up, I awaken. That's the meaning, that's what the Greek says. Translated here as stir up, it's the same. Uh, keep in mind, I stir up your pure minds. That's very interesting. The pure mind here means the tested mind. The Greek actually indicates something which is tested by derivation, tested by sunlight. Your minds are those which have been renewed by God as believers. You came to Christ, you trusted in his shed blood, you experienced conversion by the power of the Spirit. Your whole mind and outlook was changed. It became different, purified by God and set aside for him. You no longer think as a worldling, you think as a Christian. Your hopes and aspirations are spiritual but your minds also have been tested. You've held to that. That's what the original Greek word indicates. Your tested minds, proved minds. You didn't last just five minutes. You've stood. You have the new nature. The new way of thinking has clung to you and continued. But the implication of the passage is this. We, even as believers, can become complacent and steadily, to some extent, reabsorbed into the world. And we can lose our vigor, our ardor. So I awaken you, I stir you up and wake you up, those renewed minds, proven minds, but they've become weak and not functioning. And that's how the Apostle Peter begins this third chapter. Of course, he wasn't conscious of the chapter divisions. They were added later. But here, the chapter division is in a good place because the subject has changed somewhat to teaching against Christ, which is in the world. These things can happen, and we can lose our sense of danger. We can lose our discernment. We don't see what is being put across in the world how contrary it is to the things of Christ, how opposed it is to the message of God. And so we begin to be swallowed up 
by all our duties and responsibilities in the world, taking too much interest also in worldly things, becoming ineffective as Christians. We need to be woken up to the fact we're in a warfare and it's a vicious warfare and there's great hostility to the mind of Christ and the message of God and the campaign of Christ in the world. So that's the sense of the first verse. It can be read easily, but it should shake us in both which I stir up, awaken your tested minds by way of remembrance, reminding you of all the things that you know. And verse two, that you may be mindful, particularly keep in mind, and here is a, a verse which is, very helpful to us in promoting and establishing the equality of the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are both equally vital and important to us, even concerning last things. We are living in the last times, the church age, the gospel age. It is very likely, or so we feel, that we are living in the very last phase of the last times. Both Old and New Testaments will keep us alive to this. The Old Testament isn't less relevant to us. It's full of teaching about these things. That ye may be mindful, keep very much in mind the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. So the prophets have something to say about the Antichrist and the last times and the opposition thrown at Christ and the church in the last days, and of the commandment of us, that is the authoritative prescription for life, given by us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. So both the Old Testament and the New is, to, is mentioned here by Peter, and we are to be very much in mind of the worldview imparted by both testaments and the teaching of both testaments, or else we shall fall. Just look at the end of the chapter and verse 17 and the warning there. Ye therefore, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. And there's only one way to avoid that in the mind of the Apostle Peter, and he writes under inspiration, and that is to be constantly reminded of the teaching of the prophets and the apostles about life, about their prescription for life, about end times, about the proper worldview, the state of the world, all these things. So dear friends, whether you, you, you have to read the word every day and derive its message, follow the public proclamation of the word, once a week isn't enough. Once a week you think, well, I'm, I believe in the Lord. I'm strong. I won't fall. Well, you will. And the Lord won't sustain you if you don't follow his commands and exhortations. So we gather as often as duties permit us to, to hear the word and to be built up. And it's not only the learning of the doctrines of the word. What Peter is talking about here is the constant reminders. You hear a thing five years ago, you need to hear it constantly repeated from different sources in all the different aspects that are taught in the world for your mind really to be alerted to face everything that's happening around you. It's not me exaggerating this. Look at verse two again. That ye may be mindful, that you may keep in your mind as the sense, the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. We need the constant teaching of God's word. And then verse three, this is, protecting the mind of the Christian. Knowing this first, and the sense of that term is especially knowing this. It isn't, the Apostle Peter isn't going to provide an agenda. 
It is what you need to learn. First, second, third. He's not speaking like that. He's saying, knowing this primarily, especially, this is the most important thing to know. So in a sense, if we were to teach a course of doctrine, where would we start? Or we might begin with the inspired word of God or the being of God and the Trinity. We might consider, what shall we call lesson one, lesson two? Well, the apostle Paul, Peter rather, he says, no, lesson one, this is the primary, the special thing, knowing this first before you embark on anything, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, the first and the most important thing is to know your inner warfare. And the message of God and the being of God and the message of salvation is constantly being attacked. And the church is in this world to stand for the Lord against the devil and all his powers and forces. So in effect, the Apostle Peter says here, before any session of instruction on doctrine can take place, the primary thing, the context in which it must all be taught, the most important thing is to remember the Christian warfare and the opposition and the attacks and to be very mindful and warned and conscious of it. So that's a perspective. That's something we don't naturally think about. I can think of many circles and experiences I've had over the years and Bible study groups and so on, and our human minds, we go immediately to individual tenets of doctrine. But the Apostle Peter insists it's all put in the context of the Christian warfare and the return of the Lord. Without that context, it suffers and it's diminished. Knowing this first, primarily, especially the most important thing and the context of everything, that there is a warfare and there is a, everything is under attack. And so we'll go into the details. The attack against the truth, against the gospel, against the Christian church, ultimately against the Lord, is primarily a contempt for accountability accountability to God. And that's specifically what the Apostle Peter brings up in verse three. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, the last days, remember, is the age of the church. When the Bible refers to the last days, it means the period of history between the coming of Christ and his second coming. That's the last age. Whenever you see last ages, don't think of very last ages. Think of the last phase of Earth's history between the two comings of Christ. Knowing this primarily, that there shall come in the church age, the age of the gospel, scoffers. That means deriders, revilers, people who hold the truth of God in contempt, there shall come. So throughout the gospel age, there will be Satan's campaign to deride and to bring scorn upon the church and the message of the gospel. But now I want to turn you back to Second Peter for a few seconds, because in Paul's second letter to Timothy, not Peter, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, I remind you of this. He speaks of the same thing. This know also that in the last days, the last age, the church age, perilous times shall come. And he's going to go on to speak of the campaign against the Lord, but in a different sense. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and so on, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. And then all the way down to verse 13 of Second Timothy chapter 3, 
and verse 13, but evil men and seducers, they're the scoffers, the deriders, the scorners, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, which tells us that though these attacks will happen throughout the church age, the gospel age, they will get worse toward the end. And at the very end, they will be at their very worst. So you expect that now, the attack upon the truth and the church will be worse than 2,000 years ago. Of course, there's a periodicity. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Perilous times and seasons. That suggests a periodicity. There'll be times when things are very bad, and then in God's grace, there'll be times of awakening and revival, and things will be better for a while, and then they'll get bad again. And so the times and the seasons of opposition to God and to truth will vary, but they will steadily get worse, and in the last time, they will be as bad as they could possibly be. So back to Second Peter and chapter 3 and verse 3, knowing this primarily, in the last days and worse toward the end, scoffers, deriders, revilers, walking after their own lusts, that's their motive. That's what drives them, lusts. In other words, their material, earthly desires walking according to their desires, what I want, what I want here and now, what I want for the flesh, what I want to do, what I want to be, what I want to have, what I want to enjoy, what sensual, sensual pleasures I want. It's what I want. And that will be the great engine of unbelief and opposition to God. Why will they reject accountability to God? Why will they so attack a day of judgment, a day of Christ's return, accountability to the living God? Well, because it's what they want. I'm in this world for me and what I can have and be and possess and enjoy. So their lusts rule. And as these false teachers come along, look at the words of the Apostle Peter, there shall come in the last days scoffers. In other words, we're not suggesting everyone will be exactly the same. Of course, it will be the tendency of everyone. That's how we are by nature. We're just materialists. We're just for this world and what we can have in this world. But some people will be far worse than others. And they will be the flag bearers. And they will proclaim that all that matters is number one, me and my pleasure and desire and will and enjoyment. We're not having a God. We're not having religion. We're not having a moral system imposed by God. We're not having accountability. We're not having anything of that kind. And they're motivated by lusts, desires of the heart, of the flesh. That's what the Apostle Peter is telling us. So they walk after their own lusts and gradually they'll change all society to their way of thinking. And the proof of that is before our eyes. Those of you who are younger, you've seen it even in your short lifetime. Those of you who are 30 plus, 40 plus, 50 plus are very conscious of decline, moral decline, social decline, the decline to coarseness and indecency, the rejection of old values everywhere, things that were once regarded by society at large as unclean or sinful are now promoted and advanced. Everything's changing overnight. You've seen the de deterioration. You go back, the over 50s, the over 60s, what we have seen, it is phenomenal. The change, the way society has been persuaded and changed by the scoffers of God, the deriders of accountability, the revilers of creation 
and God's authority and rights. We've seen it. This is exactly what is expected according to the scripture, what is prophesied both in the Old Testament and in the New. So there shall come in the last days, and Paul adds much worse at the end, revilers walking after their own lusts and saying, now they don't necessarily literally say this, they are all summed up as saying in effect what the Apostle Peter puts in verse 4, though they may not express it in these terms, he's speaking from a Christian point of view. They're saying, these teachers, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers, and by the fathers, is probably meant here not the patriarchs or any religious fathers, but the first human beings, but since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation, or the Big Bang, they would say, today, or whatever. So this is the great creed of the scoffers or the revilers of religion, that there is no such thing as a, a day of God, a day of judgment a return of Christ. They don't acknowledge that. They scorn that. Where is the promise of his coming? Things have always been as they now are, and that is how they will always continue. So they declare the permanence of things, generally speaking. Not the temporary nature of the world, which is the teaching of both Old and New Testament, that this present world is temporary and God will end it and there will be a day of judgment. They reject here any intervention of God, any notion that the world is just for a time. They reject spiritual realities, accountability. They reject moral values. They reject certainly, obviously, the return of Christ. They're addicted to this life. They're focused on material things and sensual pleasure and an alternative morality. And that's all really encapsulated in that fourth verse. Let me take you over to Isaiah 5, just to give you an example of this in the Old Testament. But of course, it's right through the Old Testament. And I look at uh, verses 5 and 6. I won't go into the background of Isaiah 5 but we just go directly to the verses. And now go to, this is the oracle of the vineyard. I will tell you, this is God speaking, what I will do to my vineyard. Of course, the Jews are in mind, but they represent the whole human race. The vineyard of the Lord, created with great advantages and benefits, but they've brought forth no fruit to the Lord and they've rebelled against him I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard I will take away the hedge thereof and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof and it shall be trodden down this is about judgment and all the benefits being ended I will lay it waste it shall not be pruned nor digged but there shall come up briars and thorns and so on for the verse 7 the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel representing all humanity here, and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Why is everything going to be judged? Verse 11, the great woes, the five woes of Isaiah, describing the human race. It's in Old as well as New Testament. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them, and so on. And then verse 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity. I've not time to explain the language of the prophet. And sin, as it were, with a cart rope. What a hard thing it is to 
draw a cart as though you were a horse. And the life of sin is a hard life, says the prophet Isaiah, when it's God speaking, and yet so, so enmeshed into it, so love it, the life of sin, that even though it has its great disadvantages and its hangovers and its sorrows and its disappointments, and even though it may turn upside down the conscience, we sin, however difficult, God makes it for us to sin. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords or ropes of vanity, futility, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. And then verse 19, which is almost what Peter is quoting in chapter 3 of his second epistle. Listen, Isaiah 5, 19, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that he may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel come nigh and draw nigh and come that we may know it. So as if speaking as God, they say, let, or to God, let him make speed. They scorn, they revile, they lampoon the very message of God. And then verse 20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That's happening today. Government legislation calls evil good and good evil. It turns around the whole moral order that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They take the moral order that God has written into the human constitution and they tear it up. He's published it in the Ten Commandments. He's written it in the conscience of everyone and they turn it round and do the opposite and shake the fist at God. Verse 21, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. They reject God and revelation and the wisdom of the ages, and write everything anew, and so on. Well, I could spend too much time in Isaiah 5, but it's all about judgment, and the woes will come because of the different categories of disobedience and resistance to God. And back to Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 4, and it's exactly the same. Where is the promise of his coming He's not coming again. There is no God. There is no divine moral order. There is no threat to us. We can do as we please and turn these principles round and make darkness light. And that's the war against the message of God and against the church. And then from verse 5, for this, and this brings us to a, a new and a final section, for this they willingly are ignorant of, the willful ignorance of these unbelieving teachers, the people who influence society throughout the church age, but particularly at the very end, because things are to get worse and worse. For this they willingly, willfully, we would say today, they won't listen. They won't entertain for a moment that, this, that there is a God, that there is a creator, that there is an accountability to him, that there is a message of salvation, that there is a day of judgment. They scorn it. They are willfully ignorant. And then the Apostle Peter mentions certain things, which I won't go into in depth, but just sum them up that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Creation, they willfully reject creation. It's irrational to reject creation. It's irrational to reject that this is a designed universe and a designed world. Design is everywhere. Design is evident. In this educated age, we've all learned the fundamentals of biology. We all know about the great biological cycles and the order. Everyone knows the, the various tables of uh, 
components and parts of life, the building blocks of life. Everyone knows that this is a fantastic display of order and design, not accident and farce. And even the most ardent evolutionists have to say that the, the main task of evolution is to find an alternative explanation for all the evidence of design and to be able to demonstrate to society that there is a credible, rational explanation. And it's a pretty hard task, and they can't do it. There are so many flaws, because the rational thing is to see the design and to see creation, to see the mind behind the universe. But society is determined not to see that. And so the feeble, error-shot, rational explanation gets the hearing. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that this is a created world. They shut their minds to it, because that gets in the way of their motive to have what I want, do what I want, enjoy what I want, be what I want, disobey all moral principles, believe them to be fictitious and an imposition and to get rid of them, to get rid of what they think is a superstitious religious worldview. So they willfully disregard the obvious and so eventually they teach everyone to be the same. So you look at the Poles and so many years ago the vast majority of people in England believed there was a God and there was a creator, and steadily the proportion goes down. As these teachers, these extreme rationalists, and commandeering all the means at their disposal, the literary world, the television world, the soaps, everything you can imagine, they brainwash society to think as they do, and desire as they do. And so we see the great change in outlook, and viewpoint of society. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water and the reason the Apostle Peter mentions the watery beginning of the world is because he's going to say that things haven't always been as they are. They willfully are ignorant of the flood, Noah's flood, that early destruction of society to impose a warning on society whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now post-flood, the present world order, by the same word are kept they're not kept by material powers and means. The whole world would disintegrate and life would fall if there wasn't a life force, as it's been called. If there wasn't that invisible power that maintains all things. It's the word of God. The heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept, but it's only a temporary world. It's kept in store. It's reserved unto fire. It was destroyed at the time of the flood by water. It will be melted down at the time of the Lord's return by fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So there's willful ignorance. They want to believe in stability, no divine interference. That's the opposite of the message of God, which is instability, a temporary world. They want to believe in impunity. You can do as you like. There'll be no judgment. When the message of God is that there is judgment. God will hold us to account. They want to believe everything is upheld by 
natural means, natural processes. But the truth is, and the message of God is as upheld by divine power for a period of time known to him. They want to reject worship, but the message of God is that we are to seek him and praise him and walk with him. They want to believe there is no authority from any God. The Christian message is the opposite. The message of God, we're under the authority of God. Listen to the culture of today. Listen to the popular music and songs of today. The rock scene of today. What does it uphold? It upholds entirely these things which are the opposite of the Christian message. That whole scene is in the pocket of these last age extreme teachers. That whole scene and all its lyrics is about liberty from authority, anti-authority, anti-moral, anti-accountability, anti-judgment. We could be talking about the first coming of Christ, his incarnation, his amazing, astonishing, atoning death, bearing away the sin of all who are to be saved on Calvary's cross. But Peter is focusing on his second coming, his return, the end of the world, and the false teachers want that to appear to be fanciful, fictitious, and ridiculous. They scorn it, revile it, vilify it, try to get everybody to laugh at it, to reject it as fairy tale, as ridiculous. They bombard the schools with this teaching, and the young people are told these things with such derision, and the class laughs, class after class, taught and educated to laugh at God throughout the length and breadth of the land. These are the last days. Peter began by saying, I've got to make you, I've got to awaken you, Christian people. I've got to stir up your pure minds to wake up to the battle we're in. Now there's a tendency among many quite sound and well-known teachers in many respects in the Christian church to talk these days about the task of the Christian church is not only to preach about Christ, but to reform the world, they're saying. To join hands even with the politicians. The ministry of Christ is to lift up the poor and revive nations. What Christ wants to do is to come again one day to a world which has been completely restored by the activities of the Christian church so that all nations are lifted up at a social level. I don't see any of that in the scripture. I see the Apostle Peter here saying, let me stir up and awaken your minds. You're in a battle. This is a battle to the death. There is Christ the Savior, the salvation which is in him. He's coming again. There, is, there are the teachers of this world trying not only to eradicate all that from the minds of the people, but to make them see it as absurd, as ridiculous, so that everybody thinks the same way. We can change morals to suit ourselves. We can scorn God and reject him. We can regard materialism as king and lord, and we can do exactly what pleases us. The opposite of the Christian church. Yes, we have a commission to do good where we can, we're first and foremost proclaimers of the gospel and of salvation. We're bringing people to him. We're not reforming the world. We do good wherever we can. As the world gets worse, it won't allow us to do much good because any good has to be done on its terms, has to share its values. You see the whole business with Europe now. The transformation of Europe whether we're in Europe or whether we're out of Europe, we can only have any trade with Europe, and mark you, we want this too, 
so long as the values of Europe are taught. And there are values too, tragically. Now, what are the values of Europe? Equality, sexual equality, things that are totally opposed to the standards of God, things that are evil in his sight, made lawful, and the law turned against the people who think in line with God and his revelation and the scriptures. This is the way it's all going. You can't do good even in this world. Not so very long ago, we had an EC commissioner who dared to say that he didn't agree that he was against homosexuality. He had to be deposed. Within literally weeks of that declaration, he had to resign. He couldn't be a commissioner. You can't do good and join hands with the world. This campaign, the Antichrist, the campaign against Christ, against revelation, God's truth against the church, is nearing its peak. So wake up, says Peter. I stir your pure minds. You're in a battle. Proclaim the truth. Proclaim the first coming of Christ, his atoning death, the way of salvation. Proclaim the second coming of Christ over this world. Teach it to as many people as you can. Don't be distracted. Do good as you have the opportunity to people around you and in society. But it isn't your prime mission. You're in a battle. That's a fiction. That's a nonsense. We are to win souls and reach lost people. Incidentally, and it's not so incidental, that is itself the greatest social work imaginable. In this land and elsewhere, it's through the salvation of the maximum number of souls that the whole of society has been lifted up, not through political reform primarily, but that's an aside. Dear friends, this is the purpose of these verses. Our time is out. We've looked, first of all then, at the need to protect our own mind and outlook. We've looked at the contempt of the teachers of this world for accountability and the willfulness of their ignorance. And they're spreading that as fast as they can to everyone. And our assignment is to stand for the truth and the gospel and to protect our own minds from worldliness. Well, the Apostle Peter will tell us how we do that in the last part of the chapter. But that's sufficient for us this morning. May God be with us and help us all. Let's sing together the hymn number 608.